Hi, welcome back to this Friday edition of Focal Point and AFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name, your congenial, convivial, and amiable host. Talking in the last segment a little bit about uh, homosexual marriage, and Jeremy Irons, of all people, British actor, making the interesting point that if gay marriage is imposed on the entire country by the Supreme Court, there would be no logical reason to keep a father from marrying his own son. They don't even have to, there doesn't have to be anything kinky about it. He just marries his own son. Then when he dies, it goes to his legal spouse and there's no death tax. That's one way to get around the 55% or whatever it is, 45% death tax. And then his son does the same thing, gets the end of his life and he just marries his son. And then when he dies, the estate passes to his spouse, whether there's anything hinky or kinky or not going on about that. And that's Jeremy Irons' point. This same-sex marriage thing goes through. It is going to be a a field day for uh, lawyers. Now, one of the issues we talked about uh, just briefly in that last segment was the fact that homosexuals are pressing and demanding the right to get married. Now, we talked about the fact they've already got it. They've got the right to get married. They have full marriage equality. They get married just like everybody else in America. The same rules apply to everybody. Want to get married? Here's how you do it. One adult, non-relative member of the opposite sex. But this is a mantra for them. This is a crusade for homosexual activists to get be able to get married. They want the label. They want the term. So the question then becomes, well, when they are able to do it, when there are legal changes made where they can go get a marriage certificate, how many of them actually do that and here to help us sort through some of that good friend of this program mike mcmanus uh, mike and his wife um, harriet are co-chairs of marriage savers that's a ministry whose goal is to help churches and communities cut their divorce rate and raise their marriage rate they've been extremely successful mike and harriet have been in over 200 cities and helped them adopt a community marriage policy and in the process have likely saved as many as a hundred thousand marriages. Mike, welcome back to Focal Point Thank with you, Brian, Brian Fisher. Great to be with you. Well, Mike, let's talk about what uh, what I brought up. Um, gays are pressing, they're demanding, insisting on being given the right to, to marry. So when they are given that right, what do they do? Well, many of them, most of them don't get married at all. You know, remember that last year, uh, California legalized same-sex marriage from May through November until it was overturned by Proposition 8. And um, uh, the, the result was that the, uh, there were about 18,000 gay or lesbian couples who married, but that's in a state with about 650,000 gays and lesbians. So uh, that's about a 5% marriage rate. <laughs> they had six months to marry. 95% of them didn't marry. So clearly they're more interested in the rhetoric than they are in the reality of marriage. So your your research indicates, Mike, that, you know, the bottom line is gays and lesbians are really not that interested in actually getting married because, according to your research, only 5.5% of homosexuals get married when they have the opportunity to do it. That's right. The same thing happened in Massachusetts. It's just a stunning thing, and, and, and this statistic hasn't been gotten out anywhere I wrote a column about it recently, and uh, and I appreciate your giving it exposure here on your show, because we tend to think the gays have got the momentum on this issue. But part of the reason they have the momentum is we haven't been very effective in in, in fighting and giving evidence on the other side. Well, and when you think about this, Mike, and I, I want you to elaborate on this just a little bit, you have five and a half percent of the homosexual population, and that represents a tiny sliver of the American demographic. That's right. They're 1.7% of the whole population. Now, another 1.8% are bisexual. They, they, have, they float in and out of different male or female relationships. But just take the hard figure, 1.7, according to a, a major research uh, study recently. 1.7 is very small, really. Uh, but it's still, in California, with 38 million residents, that would be about 650,000 uh, people, and uh, that, that means you could have 300,000 marriages, and, and they had only 18,000. So what you've got here, Mike, and this is kind of the astonishing thing when you look at the big picture, you have homosexuals comprise a tiny sliver of the American population, 
percent, not counting the bisexuals, um, and only 5.5 percent of them get married when they have the chance. So the point you make is you got 5.5 percent of the 1.7 percent of the entire population of America. And they're pressing this entire country to ditch the institution of marriage, which has served us well from the from day one in American history. Yeah, my question for the Supreme Court is this. Why should 5% of 1.7% of the population force a change in the traditional definition of marriage that would deny children a parent? That's the part that is particularly onerous. And, and the, 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 the loss to children here is, is extremely profound. Uh, you may remember there was a video that went sort of viral about a month ago of a young girl named Grace Evans, 11 years old, and she actually testified before uh, a committee of the Minnesota legislature, and her question, which is profound, is which parent do I not need, my mom or my dad? <laughs> hmm. Well, no one answered her. She paused eight seconds, and then she added, I hope you can see that every child needs a mom and a dad. Please don't change your law on marriage to say otherwise. Well, you know, and Mike, you think about that. We, we know from all the social research uh, and that the optimal nurturing environment for children is in a home with a mom and a dad. All of the research confirms that. We, we know Absolutely. the number of pathologies that are associated with either a missing mother or a missing father. And yet what you're talking about, Mike, here with gay marriage is you're talking about deliberately creating environments for children with a missing mom or a missing dad. That's right. It's cruel. Uh, Same-sex marriage would deprive a child of one parent, either the mother or the father. And I think that's a heartless thing to do. Uh, as Grace put it, which parent do I not need, my mom or my dad? You know, and, and, and you think about, uh, I want to I want to talk, you've got a, a part of your column where you talk about some of the, the environmental impact on children that grow up in these right. same-sex households. But going back just for a minute to this, you know, we have 5.5% of gays get married when they can. They're 1.7% of the population. So you have 5.5%, one twentieth of 1.7%, one fiftieth of the population, <laughs> yeah. want to dictate marriage policy, domestic policy, to all 315 million Americans. But, Mike, your point is they don't get married when they can. Why? Why, why do you think they're pressing so hard then for the label of marriage if they don't actually want to get married? I think they're trying to destroy the institution of marriage, which they can't really participate in from their point of view. I mean, if they were attracted to someone of the opposite sex, you know, they would they would marry them. But apparently they are not, and they have this uh, perversion, really, uh, of being attracted to someone of the same gender. Um, many of these uh, homosexuals and lesbians were molested as children. We. This is one thing we need to show compassion here because this is not so, something they chose to do, the, and that's what confused them as they grew up. Uh, uh, there's a report that's going to be published uh, quite shortly uh, by uh, a scholar who, who gives evidence that uh, children of lesbians, 58% of them, when they become young adults, consider themselves gay. 58%. So not, 58%. And that, and that would argue pretty powerfully. We know there's no genetic transmission here no. uh, from studies that have been done on identical twins. Right. So obviously it's going to be environmental factors. It's going to be maybe very early sexual experiences. I think right. you're exactly right about that, Mike. And sometimes these sexual experiences, the sexual molestation can happen to a child at such an early age that either he doesn't remember it or... Right. He doesn't recognize the powerful imprint that that had on his sexual identity. Well, the study by Kansas State Professor of Family Studies, Walter Schrum, is the, is the author of this study. And what he did was he interviewed uh, children of lesbians who were in their 20s. So that's presumably after they've been able to work out any adolescent confusion. And 58% of them call themselves gay. Well, you know, there was a, a study that Mark Regners did, University of Texas at Austin, yes. their flagship school. I remember that. And it, wasn't, it didn't come out too long ago. And one of the things I remember very distinctly is, is he did a similar thing to what Professor Shrum had done. He talked to adults who had grown up in same-sex households. Right. And 23% of them reported unwanted sexual touching of one kind or another, all the way to molestation and so forth. 
So 23%, the average in the heterosexual community is 2%. So you have children that are in these same-sex households, and it could be, you know, from a one-night stand of a lover, from an unrelated adult partner, which we know is the most dangerous place for children uh, right. anywhere to be living in the same home with an adult to whom they're not related. Um, but obviously, if you've got 23% are reporting unwanted sexual touching, that's got to have a pretty powerful impact on a young child in their view of their own sexuality. Yes, the data you just gave shows a 10 to 1 ratio. The child is 10 times more likely to be uh, touched inappropriately by their own parent uh, or by a partner of that parent. And uh, the consequence is uh, Regnerus's study showed that these young people uh, do very poorly academically, uh, have a difficult time holding jobs, are quite likely to be on welfare. Uh, so it's really horrific. Mm. Well, and, you know, what, what Shrum's uh, research is definitely supporting is the idea that uh, that one of the fundamental drivers of a same-sex identity is environment. It, it, it's experience. It's the exactly. kind of examples you're given, what you're exposed to, what you're taught, maybe even what you uh, experience has a powerful, powerful impact on that. Well, Mike, uh, before we're done, give us uh, some more information about where people can find out more information about Marriage Savers. You and Harriet doing a great work of strengthening marriages in one community after another. Maybe some of our listeners would be interested in getting more information about how they could bring you to their community. Uh, I'd like to do that, but I'd like to read one other quote from a young person who heard this this 11-year-old. Do we have time for that? Uh, we got about 40 seconds. Um, well, I'm at marriagesavers.org, and you can get information there about our work. But this is a seven-year-old named Cameron Lasowski, and he heard that quote, and he watched the video of this 11-year-old girl, and what he said was that, uh, that he felt like he was, gonna, he was on, a, like a, on, a, on a cliff trying to reach across to get to the other side, and he said, Mom, I need both you and Dad. In, in my house, in my family. I can't get to the other side unless you're both part part of it. i got to have both of you to build that bridge to get me to the other side. Right. All right, Mike McManus with Marriage Savers. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate very much you being with us. MarriageSavers.org. Back in two, stay with us. Focal Point AFR Talk.